Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. This morning, my task is to, is to talk about the giving experience. Amen. So I will be reading from Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 17. And it reads, Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Amen. For years I have, re have visited many churches, which I'm sure we all have, where most of them were small congregations where every time there was a service, for whatever the reason may have been, there were most of the time two or three offerings taken up. Often, the one in leadership over the offering may have made comments that were unappealing and often made those who may not have had to give harbor feelings of guilt and shame due to their personal giving experience. This is so often a reason many will use as an excuse not to come to church. This is a sad excuse to use, however many do use it. This is one of the many reasons why Hosea 4 and 6a says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The giving experience should always be a joyous occasion, regardless of what one has to offer when they know the Lord and strive to keep his commandments. We should be happy to offer our Father only a portion of what he has blessed us with. It's not like he's asking for it all. I remember hearing a long time ago the old saying, always remember where you came from. And I want to add to that, and who brought you there. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, Moses was preparing the people before they crossed over into the promised land to remember this very thing. I don't think they realized that in the 40 years of their wandering in the wilderness, their every need was met. They never had to worry about food. Their shoes never wore out. They never got blisters on their feet. Their clothes continued to endure the weather conditions. They were protected the entire time they were out there. Yet, often, they complained about what they didn't have. We do the same thing today. Often, we as a people take for granted those silent blessings, subconsciously expecting certain things to be until they aren't. Or can I quote another saying, you never miss the water until the well runs dry. Many people think that life is about reaching certain goals and status. If they can earn enough money to buy that certain house, shop for those certain types of clothes, eat in the best restaurants and strive to keep up with the Joneses, then they've gotten somewhere in life. Now don't misunderstand it, what I'm saying. I'm not saying that striving to have the finer things in life is wrong. But when we forget how we got those things, that's where we mess up. When things are going well in our lives, we often take credit for our own prosperity and become proud and boastful that our hard work has gotten us where we are. Yes, we may have worked hard for those things, but we can't forget that our strength, our drive, and our compassion had to come from somewhere. We can become so busy striving for and managing wealth that we push God right out of our lives, believing that we're doing it all on our own. But God is the one who gives us everything we have. And it is God who expects us to humbly manage it for him. So what's important is we must not forget this right here. Family, God don't need our money. He does not expect us to give more than we can, but he does expect us to give in proportion to how he has blessed us. For some, a tenth of their income may be a burden. For most of us, that might be far too little. But we must remember that everything we have belongs to God anyway. We must look at what we have been blessed with and then give in proportion to what we've been given. But look at it this way. We can never outgive God. Well, those of us here 
that are a part of us and my family, we recite Luke 638 every Sunday when it comes time to give. So SMI, what does Luke 638 says? Give. give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Amen. Fam, now I want to leave us with this one, this last thought. Real life comes from total commitment to God and living by every word that comes from him. How can we live by his word? One, by recognizing our need for it. Why? Because without it, we perish. Two, by agreeing that God alone can truly satisfy us. Why? Because he alone can quench our every thirst. Three, by praying for God's presence, wisdom, and direction as we read scripture. Why? Because without it, we'll be tossed to and fro, not knowing where we're going. Four, savor the relationship we have with him through Christ. Why? Because Jesus is the only way to him. And five, practice what he teaches us. Why? Because this is our assurance that he will always make good on his word family when we abide by these things knowing and assured of where our blessings comes from we should never have a problem offering back a portion amen amen, amen. We're at Deuteronomy chapter 28, starting at verse 1, and the word of the Lord reads as follows. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God blessed shall you be you may be seated in the presence of the Lord and we're releasing our musicians amen Deuteronomy chapter 28 reveals the generosity of God towards those who seek his will. Not your own will, but are willing to seek his will. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, everything that you're in need of, shall be added unto you. But if you will, just turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, where the Bible tells us, where the writer of Hebrews write, but without faith it is impossible to please him, meaning God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. I want you to understand the translation of he is is Yahweh. Yahweh literally means to be. And so we're talking about this God, this God, he is, is Yahweh, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, seeking God is not a love him and leave him affair. It is an ongoing relationship. You see, our relationship with God becomes the foundation of our relationship with each other. It is also the blueprint of or to the unstoppable, inexhaustible, and unlimited blessings of God. If you seek him, seek his will. And Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 through 14 outlines unstoppable blessings for those who stand in agreement with God and implement his instructions. However, 
Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 68, outlines cursings for those who choose their own way and not seek God's will. As much as we love to be blessed by God, we can fall under these curses if we choose to disobey God's word and be out of his will and way. We can't genuinely obey God's word if we don't seek him first. We want the blessings of protection and we want the blessings of fertility and prosperity. We want the blessings of provision. We want the blessing of position and status and we want him to bless all the works of our hands. Unlimited blessings require unlimited obedience and unlimited obedience comes by unbroken fellowship with God. So today's message is entitled, Position Yourself for Unlimited Blessings. Are you with me? Now, last week we talked about the three paradigms of, of unlimited blessings. And we based it on Genesis chapter 21. And I'm just going to reread it because I want to highlight verse 3. But in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make your I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Verse 3. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. If I can draw your attention to I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. How many know that no one, no thing, not the devil, not your enemy can curse you, but you can curse yourself. And I'm here to tell you that even you may not say a mumbling word against another person. You may not even curse them with your lips, but withholding something that they may be in need of is a curse. The Bible tells us that God does not withhold any good thing from those who are standing up and walking rightly. And therefore, if somebody's in need of a tithe, if someone needs your talent or time and you withhold it, you have just cursed them. And so we bring cursings upon ourselves. But the more that we bless others, the more it ricochets back to us and bless us back. Now we talked about the three paradigms of the unlimited blessings. The first one is, and let me see if it's on the screen. Yes. The first one is, is promise for posterity. If you're writing, write this down. We're talking about the future generations, those who come after you. But promise for posterity is predicated on acquiescence, alignment and action. If you're writing this down, agreement being an alignment and taking action. Prepared for purpose is to be a blessing. So to be a blessing to your church, to be a blessing to your family, to be a blessing to your neighborhood, to be a blessing to your coworker, to be a blessing to someone else. Prepared for purpose is hinged on hearing, listening to and obeying. The third one is positioned for praise. That is to be blessed. And positioned for praise is relegated on looking, watching, and expecting. Now last week, we talked a whole lot about promised for posterity, but I just want to recapitulate just a little bit that last week we talked about that humankind was blessed by God's divine, divine elocution. 
in creation. That is to say in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, the Bible tells us in verse 27 that God created both male and female. He created humankind in his image. And in verse 28, he tells us that he's blessed us and he sends us forth to be fruitful and multiply and to kabosh or subdue the earth realm. So this is the assignment of humankind. And God has blessed humankind to do these things. And so that's divine elocution, him speaking it out. As believers, we are both God's natural and supernatural posterity. We are sons and daughters of God. And as children of God, what the Father elocutes, the children execute, if you remember last week. But Yeshua, Jesus says in John chapter 12, Starting at verse 49, he says this, follow along. For I have not spoken, not executed on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, an elocution, what I should say and what I should speak. Verse 50. And I know that his command is everlasting life, being Yeshua says, if I obey God, if I obey God, then I shall have eternal life. So he helps us understand that in our obeying God, we will have eternal life or everlasting life. But he continues, therefore, whatever I speak, whatever I execute, just as the Father has told me, elocutes, so I speak, I execute. Are you with me? So whatever Jesus executes, it was elocuted by God. It was spoken by God. The instructions that God the Father gave Jesus, he executed those instructions. So let's just look just for a moment. Prepared for purpose. Somebody say prepared for purpose. And we're all prepared for a purpose, amen? But when we look in back at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1, it says, Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey. Remember last week we said it was shama shama. When God says something twice, that means he meant you to understand that that's what he wants you to do. And so diligently obey means shama shama. It means to hear, to listen, and to obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully, which is acquiesce, align and put into action, to agree, to align yourself, and then put it into action. All his commandments, which I command you today. Now, let's look at the Lord's commandments, if you will, or at least his commands. So the commands we must obey Working with two devices, boy. It's no joke. So the commands we must obey and observe, if we look, we have the moral laws. The moral laws are on murder and theft and adultery, the things that we should not do, the things that will not only damage or hurt us, will harm other people. Uh, social laws on property and inheritance or marriage and divorce. And we thought that our government system, our legislature, uh, developed these laws. No, these laws came from the Bible. These are biblical laws that were uh, put into play, and now they're on documents that we read, and, the, and God's name is taken off of them, as if we wrote them ourselves. And then food laws on what is clean and unclean, on cooking and storing food. Many of you understand that if it wasn't for these particular food laws, you wouldn't go into a restaurant because anything goes. Amen? 
and then purity laws on menstruation of women and skin diseases or mildew, etc. So these laws are in the Bible and these are commands of God. He gives us instructions and he said, if you follow these instructions, you'll have good days. You'll have long life because you won't hurt people and you won't kill people and, and you will be able to live in a community and sociably live with one another and you'll be able to eat food that is properly cooked and stored so that you don't get sick but then also remembering and observing the feast days and remembering and observing the feast days these are the Lord's feasts not the Jewish feast but the Lord feasts. If he gives us instructions to follow and then he gives us feasts that we can celebrate, he gives us these feasts that we will remember him and who he is. Now, just for a moment, let's look at the Ten Commandments because some of you have never seen them before. <laughs> They've taken them out of municipal buildings. They've taken them out of other public places. They're not in the courthouses. They're not in the schoolhouses and they're not in your house. I'm sorry, maybe some of your houses. But here they are. You shall not, you shall have no other gods before me. Do not make any graven image. Do not carve them. Do not make statues. If you're worshiping statues and you got saints and that you're praying to and all of that, that's not God. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall not cuss him. You shall not say GD. You shall not say any of those things because you have broken God's law. Remember the Shabbat, the Sabbath, and keep it holy. That is a day of rest. He says you work six days. You need to take a day of rest. Amen. And it says, honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill and need not even with your, your tongue because Yeshua explains to us is the very things that you say, even in your heart can be murderous. You shall not commit adultery even in your heart. You shall not steal even a pen and a piece of paper that you got from work. Jackie, where are you? I owe you a few pins. <laughs> you shall not bear false witness. That means telling a lie. And you shall not covet anything that belongs to anybody else. Don't covet it. Amen. So go to Matthew chapter 22, because many people are saying, well, that's the Old Testament. We don't have to follow the Old Testament. But Jesus declares the same thing in the New Testament. We can find the commandments of God in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Yeshua, Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Verse 39, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, he didn't just come up with this. This is found throughout the Bible. And, is, and, and in fact, we sing this in Deuteronomy chapter 6 when we sing Shammah. The very verse after that is talking about to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That's why seeking God and being in a relationship with him is the blueprint for our relationship with other people. Amen. And so in observing the feast days in Deuteronomy 16, if you have it turned there, Deuteronomy 16, I know it's projected up there. So if you don't have it, it's okay. But Deuteronomy 16 and 16, it says three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses all the feast of un at the feast of unleavened bread at the feast of weeks and at the feast of tabernacles and they shall not appear before the Lord empty handed. Verse 17 says, every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. And that's what um, uh, evangelist Angela exhorted on this morning. But it's important for us to understand that during biblical times that they made uh, journeys to Jerusalem to worship 
and observe the feast days. And when they came, they brought a harvest. They brought the, the increase of their barns, the increase of their fields. They brought an offering to God. They did not come empty handed. And so it's important to know that in observing the feast day, we have already instituted in our ministry during these times because we know that the portal of God is open. That's when he's the closest to us during his feast days. And when he's close to us, he is listening to us. He is giving us his undivided attention and we have his attention. So therefore we sow during that time. We call them the sacrificial fast or vow. And after we break fast or vow, we give an offering and then we do it again during Pentecost, during harvest time. We bring a, a vow to the Lord and then we do it again in the fall, during the fall feast. We do it again, we sow a seed. Three times a year we do that. And we take the, those funds that we raise, we actually give locally, then we give nationally, and then we give uh, internationally, globally. And so we have set and instituted in our ministry to honor the Lord and observe these feasts by bringing an offering so that we may help others. Amen. We're sowing our seeds back into the earth realm. Stay with me. So the principle of blessings is to give. That's the principle of blessings. And how many know that where there are principles, there are patterns. And where there are patterns, there are practices that we must implement. So the principle of blessings is to give, to become wealth distributors. And many of us will say and make a prayer or pray to God and say, Lord, make me a wealth distributor. If you want to become a wealth distributor, that means you have to give. You can't withhold. You can't say, well, this is all I have, God, and I'm going to just buy uh, you who or whatever and not sow it. Sow it and watch God work. And so here's the patterns. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse 6. I'm struggling with oxygen, y'all. <laughs> In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, Paul writes, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. You're going to get what you sow. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things, meaning doors that you could not possibly open will he open for you, because you sowed bountifully may have an abundance for every good work. Verse 9, as it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Verse 10, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed for you have sown and increased the fruits of your righteousness. So God gives a seed to a sower. God gives a seed to a sower. That means those who give a tithe, the tenth of whatever they get in, they give out. God keeps giving you bread to eat so that you will continue the cycle. You keep, you, he keeps giving you a seed, and you keep sowing that seed, and you have bread to eat. And it's not a little bread, but it's a whole lot of bread. Are you with me? The Bible tells us in Luke 6, 38, as we read, given it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And I know it, it's a concept that uh, when Yeshua was explaining this, he was also talking about judging other people. That if you judge people, other people will judge you back. 
Amen. Well, the same concept with whatever you do, because Galatians 6 and 7 tells us that uh, do not be deceived that God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. So if you sow sparingly and you wonder why you never seem to have enough because you didn't meet the standard. You didn't meet the standard. And that's between you and God, not you and me. But between you and God, as long as I'm doing what I need, as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And see, I'm concerned about me, but I can tell you about what the word of God is saying. Are you with me? And as long as I'm in alignment with God, I shall prosper. I declare that because it's decreed in God's word. As long as I stay in acquiesce uh, alignment and take it to action, trust in his word. Without a shadow of a doubt, I shall be blessed. You shall be blessed. In Deuteronomy 28 verse 1b, it says that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. No more scrambling down below. No, lo no longer trying to make ends meet. That God will set you in a position, in a place where people will bless you, where people will put in your hand and people and doors will open that you could not open. And it's your qualification and it doesn't even matter because you don't have to be qualified for it. And God to open the door. And the Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, verse 22, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he has no sorrow to it. Look, let me tell let me explain something to you. God may allow you to get a car, but you have a car note. God may allow you to get a house and you got a mortgage. And God has blessed you with the ability to do that. Don't get me wrong. But the Bible says here, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he has no car note. He has no mortgage. He has no sorrow to, are you with me? When you get to the level in God and the things that you're doing, remember the principle of blessing is that you give. And if you give the standard, the blessing of the Lord applies to you. It makes you rich and you're able to pay off mortgages and pay off car notes and pay off debt. Not only for yourself, but for other people. In Deuteronomy 8 and 18, the Bible says, and he shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power. He gives you the wisdom to gain wealth so that he may establish his covenant that he may, that your stocks that you invest in will prosper, that, that your 40K or 410K or whatever it's called will prosper, that the things that you touch that are connected to you shall prosper. Because he gives you the wisdom to get wealth. And the wisdom start with the principles. The patterns are here. That you give sparingly, you reap sparingly. You give bountifully, you reap bountifully. I remember years ago when I was, when I was um, in North Carolina. And I went to this church for the very first time. For the very first time I went there and uh, I just knew maybe the pastor or whomever, and it was a very long time. And uh, I went there and it was this young woman who said, when she gave her testimony, she said, look, my tires are bald. And she said, and I should just, you know, I, I probably should have stayed home for safety reasons. But she said, but I had to come here today. I believe God for a blessing. For me, sowing my time, coming to church tonight, that night, the Lord le led me. He moved my heart to go to the young lady and says that I'm going to buy her tires for her car. I didn't know her. I never saw her again, but she sowed the sea of showing up and the Lord moved me to bless her. And you know, the Lord blessed me. You know, the Lord blessed me. Amen. So pos positioned for praises. Somebody say positioned for praises. Yes. Now we're in Deuteronomy 28 verse 12, if you will. Deuteronomy 28 verse 12. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 12, the Lord will open to you his good treasure. 
the heavens to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe, underline that word observe, observe, if you carefully observe them. In Hebrew is shamar, and it means keep, watch, preserve. It is also akin to this word. Shabar, and we find Shabar in Psalms 145, verse 15. That's 145, verse 15. And the Bible says, the eyes of all look expectantly. Shabar, which means to look or seek, watch or wait, and expect, believe to you. And you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and, and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. And so the Bible is telling us to look, meaning seek God for every situation. Watch, meaning wait on him and then expect to believe that he's going to perform it. We're back at Deuteronomy 28, verse 14. Amen. So you shall not turn aside from another or any of the words which I command you this day to the right or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Now I'm going to pause right there just for a moment because I want to share a little bit about Esau. Remember Esau? Jacob's brother. Well, he was the firstborn, but really the Bible says that Jacob was uh, grabbing onto his heel. That's why he was called Jacob. And so Esau was born red, but I'm not going to give all the details, but I want to highlight who, e who Esau was and what Esau did. Esau was entitled to the blessing of his father, because he was the oldest, but he despised his, he despised his father, God, and he despised the blessing. The Bible tells us that he sold his blessing for a bowl of bean soup to his brother. He says, I don't care about that. And so he went after other gods and he went after pagan women. So he had pagan wives and pagan concubines. And, and so he was living the pagan life. Whereas Jacob was living a righteous life. And yeah, he was probably more like a mama's boy, but he received the blessings of God. Now, I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12. And the writer writes, verse 14, Pursue peace with all people in holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, like who? Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright because he despised it. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. I want you to understand something. That um, years ago, when I was living in North Carolina, and when I was living in North Carolina, I hit rock bottom. I did. I hit rock bottom. And um, I missed a few. I, didn't, I didn't, didn't miss paying my rent. And one thing I remember was pay my rent. No matter what, you pay your rent. But I started missing payments on my Mercedes SUV. And in missing payments on my Mercedes SUV, I, I knew that one day they were going to come for it. And I remember one Sunday I was at church service and the Lord said, I want you to bless that woman over there with a car. And I said, surely, Lord, I'm not hearing you correctly. I'm, 
not hearing you. I'm getting a bad connection. <laughs> Must be static. And the Lord said, I want you to go over there and tell her that you're going to bless her with a car. And my feet were like lead. And I said, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I, God, I trust you. And I finally went over to her and I spoke to her and I said, uh, the Lord told me to bless you with a car. And she looked at me smiling and, you know, like, oh, that's so nice. You know how you do when you go to a ministry and somebody prophesying you a house and prophesying you a car and you politely just smile and like, yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's how she looked at me. And so and she was a young woman. She was in college and she had a little baby. And so I knew that it was a struggle for her to get around. And so the Lord that that I just really didn't didn't feel that it was my burden but the Lord burdened me to do it and so I had no money I promise you I was at rock bottom I was I was two clicks from calling my parents and saying come get a U-Haul and bring me here to Virginia because that's what eventually happened and so I went home I came here to Virginia and I went to my parents house and my brother had passed away and his car was sitting in the driveway and I went to my father and I said, um, Dad, are you planning on selling my brother's car? And he says, um, no, yeah, it doesn't matter. And I said, well, will you sell it to me? And he said, you can have it. I said, no, sir. I said, I, it has to be a sacrifice to me. And I can't tell you what I'm willing to pay. You tell me what you're willing to, to what it's worth to you. And he looked at me and he said, well, $500. And I didn't have $500 to give. And I said, Dad, is it all right if I pay you on time, if I give you installments? And he said, yes. And so it needed some work. And so I took the car, and I took and brought it back to North Carolina. And I, I did everything. I scraped my money around and, and collect my money and try to fix the light and fix this and fix that and all of this. And I called the young lady, and I told her to come get the car. It took her two weeks to come get the car. I would think that somebody would run and come get their car. It took her two weeks. And in that two weeks, within that two weeks, some guys came to get my Mercedes SUV. And as they were pulling my Mercedes SUV, I remembered I had books that I had written on prosperity for the today's saints. And there were testimonies of God blessing me. Now, I have to admit, I got entangled with some foolishness that put me in a place where, I was, where things were drying up for me. Doors were not opening. I had aligned myself with the wrong people, the wrong group of people that didn't do things right. And they were pastors and leaders, and they were doing things and nevertheless, so I, I stopped them, I stopped them, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, I, I left my box of books in here, and so I opened the box, and I said, one day, this book is going to help you, and I gave it to the other guy, and I said, it's on prosperity, and I believe God that he's going to bless you just because I sowed this seed in your hand. And I took the box, and I tell you the truth, uh, many of you know the testimony of me coming here to Virginia and how God, once I aligned myself with God, acquiesced, aligned, and then took in action. God began to open floodgates in my life. But I remember this one thing where the Bible tells us that he is not moved by our tears. That no matter how much I cried and no matter how much I begged God, when I was out of alignment, I was out of alignment and nothing worked for me. Everything was working fine for my daughter, but nothing was working for me. And I'm reminded of the story, the account in First Chronicles chapter 21, where the threshing floor of Ornan. And at the threshing floor of Ornan, uh, David was out of alignment uh, with God. He had numbered the people, and God was angry about that thing. And he, he sent an angel to start killing off the people. And David said to the Lord, he says, this is the, this, you're, you, God, you're angry with me, not the people. He says, take it out on me. And the Lord said, I want you to go to the threshing floor of Ornan, and I want you to build up an altar. 
Now that meant that David had to own the threshing floor of Ornan in order to build an altar because it belonged to Ornan. And so he shows up there and he goes to Ornan and Ornan bows down to him because he knows that he is King David. And David says, how much would you charge me? What is the price of your threshing floor? And Ornan says, Oh no, King David, you can have the threshing floor, you can have the implements, and you can have some animals to sacrifice. And David says, no, no, I can't sacrifice to God what didn't cost me anything. We can't, uh, what a sacrifice is, is a sacrifice is what is going to work. The work comes from the sacrifice. If it cost you nothing, then it was not a sacrifice. It has to cost you something. Yes, I did pay my daddy off for that car. I paid that $500 for that car. <laughs> but nevertheless, it must cost you something. It cannot work if I hand you the money. It didn't cost you anything. I might as well sold it myself. If I gave it to you free, it didn't cost you anything. It has to be a sacrifice. Amen. Amen. As I close out, I want you to stand to your feet. Amen. Stand to your feet. Whew. And last week I made a declaration over you all. And I want to declare this decree. A decree is just an issue, an authoritative command. And by the rod of the apostolic